The Hunter's Lodge Case by Agatha Christie. The famous, little grey cells, of the great detective Poirot function admirably in solving what at first seems a particularly puzzling murder mystery. After all, murmured Poirot, it is possible that I shall not die this time. Coming from a convalescent influenza patient, I hailed the remark as showing a beneficial optimism. I myself had been the first sufferer from the disease. Poirot in his turn had gone down. He was now sitting up in bed, propped up with pillows. Yes, yes, my little friend continued. Once more shall I be myself again, the great Hercule Poirot, the terror of evildoers. Figure to yourself, more Amy, that I have a little paragraph to myself in society gossip. But yes, here it is. Go it, criminals, all out. Hercule Poirot, and believe me, girls, he's some Hercules. Our own pet society detective can't get a grip on you. Cause why? Cause he's got la grippe himself. I laughed. Good for you, Poirot. You are becoming quite a public character. And fortunately you haven't missed anything of particular interest during this time. That is true. The few cases I have had to decline did not fill me with any regret. Our landlady stuck her head in at the door. There's a gentleman downstairs. Says he must see M. Poirot or you, Captain. Seeing as he was in a great to-do, and with all that quite the gentleman, I brought up, his card. She handed me the bit of pasteboard. Hon. Roger Havering, I read. Poirot motioned with his head toward the bookcase, and I obediently pulled forth the, who's who. Poirot took it from me and scanned the pages rapidly. Second son of 5th Baron Windsor. Married 1913 Zoe, fourth daughter of William Crabbe. Hunnam, I said. I rather fancy that's the girl who used to act at the frivolity. Only she called herself Zoe Carisbrook. I remember she married some young man about town just before the war. Would it interest you, Hastings, to go down and hear what our visitor's particular trouble is? Make him all my excuses. Roger Havering was a man of about forty, well set up and of smart appearance. His face, however, was haggard, and he was evidently laboring under great agitation. Captain Hastings? You are M. Poirot's partner, I understand. It is imperative that he should come with me to Derbyshire today. I'm afraid that's impossible, I replied. Poirot is ill in bed, influenza. His face fell. Dear me, that is a great blow to me. The matter on which you want to consult him is serious. My God, yes. My uncle, the best friend I have in the world, was foully murdered last night. Here in London? No, in Derbyshire. I was in town and received a telegram from my wife this morning. Immediately upon its receipt I determined to come round and beg M. Poirot to undertake the case. If you will excuse me a minute, I said, struck by a sudden idea. I rushed upstairs, and in few brief words acquainted Poirot with the situation. He took any further words out of my mouth. I see, I see. You want to go yourself, is it not so? Well, why not? You should know my methods by now. All I ask is that you should report to me fully every day, and follow implicitly any instructions I may wire you. To this I willingly agreed, and an hour later I was sitting opposite Mr. Havering in a first-class carriage on the Midland Railway, speeding rapidly away from London. To begin with, Captain Hastings, you must understand that Hunter's Lodge, where we are going, and where the tragedy took place, is only a small shooting box in the heart of the Derbyshire Moors. Our real home is near Newmarket, and we usually rent a flat in town for the season. Hunter's Lodge is looked after by a housekeeper who is quite capable of doing all we need when we run down for an occasional weekend. Of course, during the shooting season, we take down some of our own servants from Newmarket. My uncle, Mr. Harrington Pace, as you may know, my mother was a Miss Pace of New York, has for the last three years made his home with us. He never got on well with my father, or my elder brother, and I suspect that my being somewhat of a prodigal son myself rather increased and diminished his affection toward me. Of course, I am a poor man, and my uncle was a rich one, in other words, he paid the piper. But though exacting in many ways, he was not really hard to get on with, and we all three lived very harmoniously together. Two days ago my uncle, rather wearied with some recent gaieties of ours in town, suggested that we should run down to Derbyshire for a day or two. My wife telegraphed to Mrs. Middleton, the housekeeper, and we went down that same afternoon. Yesterday evening I was forced to return to town, but my wife and my uncle remained on. This morning I received this telegram. He handed it over to me, and I read. Come at once. Uncle Harrington murdered last night. 
Bring good detective if you can, but do come. Zoe. Then as yet you know no details. No. I suppose it will be in the evening papers. Without doubt the police are in charge. It was about three o'clock when we arrived at the little station of Elmer's Dale. From there a five-mile drive brought us to a small grey stone building in the midst of the rugged moors. A lonely place, I observed. Havering nodded. I shall try and get rid of it. I could never live here again. We unlatched the gate and were walking up the narrow path to the oak door when a familiar figure emerged and came to meet us. Jap! I ejaculated. The Scotland Yard inspector grinned at me in a friendly fashion before addressing my companion. Mr. Havering, I think. I've been sent down from London to take charge of this case, and I'd like a word with you, if I may, sir. My wife. I've seen your good lady, sir, and the housekeeper. I won't keep you a moment, but I'm anxious to get back to the village now that I've seen all there is to see here. I know nothing as yet as to what. Exactly, said Jap soothingly. But there are just one or two little points I'd like your opinion about all the same. Captain Hastings, here, he knows me, and he'll go on up to the house and tell them you're coming. I went on to the house. I rang the bell, as Jap had closed the door behind him. After some moments it was opened to me by a middle-aged woman in black. Mr. Havering will be here in a moment, I explained. He has been detained by the inspector. I have come down with him from London to look into the case. Perhaps you can tell me briefly what occurred last night. Come inside, sir. She closed the door behind me, and we stood in the dimly lighted hall. It was after dinner last night, sir, that the man came. He asked to see Mr. Pace, sir, and seeing that he spoke the same way, I thought it was an American gentleman friend of Mr. Pace's, and I showed him into the gunroom, and then went to tell Mr. Pace. He wouldn't give no name, which of course was a bit odd, now I come to think of it. I told Mr. Pace, and he seemed puzzled, like, but he said to the mistress, excuse me, Zoe, while I just see what this fellow wants. He went off to the gunroom, and I went back to the kitchen, but after a while I heard loud voices, as if they were quarrelling, and I came out into the hall. At the same time, the mistress she comes out too, and just then there was a shot and then a dreadful silence. We both ran to the gunroom door, but it was locked, and we had to go round to the window. It was open, and there inside was Mr. Pace, all shot and bleeding. What became of the man? He must have got away through the window, sir, before we got to it. And then? Mrs. Havering sent me to fetch the police. Five miles to walk, it was. They came back with me, and the constable, he stayed all night. And this morning the police gentleman from London arrived. What was this man like who called to see Mr. Pace? The housekeeper reflected. He had a black beard, sir, and was about middle-aged, and had on a light overcoat. Beyond the fact that he spoke like an American, I didn't notice much about him. I see. Now, I wonder if I can see Mrs. Havering. She's upstairs, sir. Shall I tell her? If you please. Tell her that Mr. Havering is outside with Inspector Jap, and that the gentleman he has brought back with him from London is anxious to speak to her as soon as possible. Very good, sir. I was in a fever of impatience to get at all the facts. Jap had two or three hours start of me, and his anxiety to be gone made me keen to be close at his heels. Mrs. Havering did not keep me waiting long. In a few minutes I heard a light step descending the stairs, and looked up to see a very handsome young woman coming toward me. She wore a flame-colored jumper, that set off the slender boyishness of her figure. On her dark head was a little hat of flame-colored leather. Even the present tragedy could not dim the vitality of her personality. I introduced myself, and she nodded in quick comprehension. Of course I have often heard of you and your colleague, M. Poirot. You have done some wonderful things together, haven't you? It was very clever of my husband to get you so promptly. Now, will you ask me questions? That is the easiest way, isn't it, of getting to know all you want to about this dreadful affair? Thank you, Mrs. Havering. Now, what time was it that this man arrived? It must have been just before nine o'clock. We had finished dinner, and were sitting over our coffee and cigarettes. Your husband had already left for London. Yes, he went up by the 6.15. Did he go by car to the station, or did he walk? Our own car isn't down here. One came out from the garage in Elmer's Dale to fetch him in time for the train. Was Mr. Pace quite his usual self? Absolutely, most normal in every way. Now, can you describe this visitor at all? I'm afraid not. I didn't see him. 
Mrs. Middleton showed him straight into the gun room and then came to tell my uncle. What did your uncle say? He seemed rather annoyed, but went off at once. It was about five minutes later that I heard the sound of raised voices. I ran out into the hall, and almost collided with Mrs. Middleton. Then we heard the shot. The gun room door was locked on the inside, and we had to go round the house to the window. Of course that took some time, and the murderer had been able to get well away. My poor uncle, her voice faltered, had been shot through the head. I saw at once that he was dead, and I sent Mrs. Middleton for the police straight away. I was careful to touch nothing in the room but to leave it exactly as I found it. I nodded approval. Now, as to the weapon. Well, I can make a guess at it, Captain Hastings. A pair of revolvers of my husband's were mounted upon the wall. One of them is missing. I pointed this out to the police, and they took the other one away with them. When they have extracted the bullet, I suppose they will know for certain. May I go to the gun room? Certainly. The police have finished with it. But the body has been removed. She accompanied me to the scene of the crime. At that moment Havering entered the hall, and with a quick apology, his wife ran to him. I was left to undertake my investigations alone.